Good, if, good afternoon to everyone and welcome. And we really want to thank the artistic piece that we have been given. I think it has soothed our hearts. Uh, we want to run through the program. My name is Mnyara Zimshonga. I'm the host. Let me quickly introduce the panel so that we can get started with the business of the day. Uh, allow me to start with the, uh, with the rector uh, and vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, uh, Professor Francis Peterson. There he is. Okay. And the rest of the other uh, panelists, uh, when I call your name, just raise your hand because some of you, I don't know who is who, so that's the way we should go. Uh, um, as I have already said, Professor you know, Francis Peterson is the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of the University of the Free State. He was previously Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Cape Town and Dean in the Engineering and Built Environment at the same university. The Executive Head, Strategy at Anglo American Platinum, Executive Vice President, Research and Development at Mintex, and the head of the Department of Chemical Engin Engineering at the Cape Technicon, now Cape Peninsula University. <coughs> he graduated from Stellenbosch University with BH, Chemical Engineering, ME, Engineering, Metal, and PhD degrees, uh, and completed a short course on financial skills and executive management with IIR training. He is a recipient of the Ernest Oppenheimer Memorial Trust Award Research Excellency and the Cape Technicon uh, Research or Researcher of the Year Award. He is a regular reviewer and a member of a range of editorial bodies and many, many other international journals. Um, allow me to say at this moment, let me cut that short because his CV can take us the whole afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, uh, person I would like to introduce is the uh, uh, Professor Peel Stolle, uh, who is uh, the uh, uh, campus vice uh, principal, academic and research at the University of the Free State at the Kwakwa campus. For our international visitors, you know, uh, University of the Free State has three campuses, the Bloemfontein campus, which is here where we are right away, and the South Campus, 10 kilometers to the south, and the Kwakwa Campus, about 300 kilometers to the northeast of, of, of the country. Uh, Professor Pio Stolle is a social anthropologist by training, and he has interest in issues of governance, gender and development, as well as social inequality. She is also a thinker and writer on the subject of the politics of knowledge production. She has worked with various academic and research institutions in South Africa and has delved into the public service, consulting, and civil society as well. Her writings include a book titled An Equal Peers, The Politics of Discourse Management in the Social Sciences, published in 2009, and a number of journal articles on governance and development and knowledge production, including the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the development on developmentalism recently. In 2011, she was recognized by the South African Department of Science and Technology with a Women in Science Award for her sterling work as a social scientist. And more recently, in 2021, she was appointed by Pope Francis to the Pontifical Academy of the Social Sciences. Thank you, Prof. Stolle. There she is. My next panelist to introduce is our uh, uh, international visitor, who is Sandu Hira. Uh, that, is, that is his pen name. Otherwise, his real name is, you know, uh, Jiu Babram. Uh, Jiu Babram is uh, the secretary of the Decolonial International Network Foundation. He is the co-editor of, of a book and the publisher of a book, Decolonizing the Mind. And he has recently published this book, which he launched on, uh, on Tuesday on our campus in the library, Decolonizing the Mind, a Guide to Decolonial Theory and, and, and Practice. He has over 25 publications, 
Jew was thrown into decolonial activism and Marxism following the execution of his brother in 1982 by the Suriname military regime. And since then, he has never stopped being a decolonial and activist thinker. And so we are privileged to, to have him to, 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 to this afternoon. And so, Babu, thank you and welcome. And allow me to say, Babu Joe is with his wife, Sisha Bono, seated over there. Sisha, you are most welcome to the University of, 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 of the Free State. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, person I would like to introduce to, to you uh, is um, uh, Sibange Mabaso. Sibange Mabaso, seated over, over there, uh, right now is, is uh, a master's student specializing in gender studies in the Center for Gender and Africa Studies at this university, at the University of the Free State. Uh, she is a multidisciplinary uh, theater maker, voice over artist, and educator. And she is a recipient of the Katinga Haynes Award for the best film student, as well as the Asia Grant Medical for best artistic achievement in the Department of Drama and Theater Arts. Allow me to cut it short there. Thank you very much. And, and oh, over there, my apologies. <laughs> I assumed everyone was here. <laughs> So please, when I call your name, for just raise your raise your raise your hand so that the the, the audience can 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 see you. Uh, the next person I would like to introduce is Tlokisani Mutambiso. Thank you. Tlokisani uh, Mutambiso is a final year education student at our beautiful university, you know, the University of the Free State on the Bloemfontein campus. He was born in the Western Cape and grew up in the Eastern Cape. He is a published poet. And I don't want to go into his poetry work. It's so fantastic. So I want to leave you salivating for his work so that you can take it from there. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, our next panelist is Absalom Ngosi. Uh, Absalom Gosi. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry for the mix-up. I think the program has been updated. And I, I okay. So, so Absalom Gosi, Dr. Ngosi Kangosi has been working in the music education fraternity for more than 14 years. He has completely occupied various, you know, vacancies within the South African education system, including being a school music teacher, African music lecturer, and arts education teacher. He was previously employed by the University of Johannesburg, Department of Childhood Education, and the Northwest University, Department of Music. As a cultural administrator, he has experience and, uh, as an education officer, arts project manager, and even organizer, among many, many other attributes of him. Thank you very much, and welcome, sir. Uh, the next panelist I would like to introduce is Ms. Ma Mbita Mankola. Correct? Thank you very much. Uh, Mbita Mankola is a professional librarian with more than 10 years of experience in various academic library sections. She is an assistant director, research and scholarly communication in the Sasso Library at the University of the Free State. She holds a master's degree in information science with specialization in research data management and higher education institutions. She has presented at many conferences, many seminars as a public speaker and serves on many public organizations and, 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 and platforms. And you are most welcome to this panel. We are looking forward to learning from you. Thank you. Uh, 
My next panelist is Ketni Ruimbo Maziwa, just next to my left, thank you. Uh, she is a third year BA governance and political transformation student and the current SRC International. So she represents the international community of students at the University of the Free State. She has been you know, in leadership positions since 2021 and has worked in various positions. She has been a chairperson of the International Students Association and she has accolades that depict her journey through and through and a journey of struggle, journey of love and many other attributes. She is an advocate of African transformation through globalization and youth empowerment and has enabled you know to host many for us in that in that in that in that in that area. So you are most welcome. Thank you. My next panelist is none other than uh, the director of the International Affairs Office, who has made it possible for this event to be taking place right now. He is none other than Dr. Cornelius Hagamaya. There he is. Dr. Cornelius Hagamaya is a higher education and legal professional rooted in the German and South African jurisdictions. He obtained his qualifications you know, uh, in Germany as a judge. And before that, before setting foot in South Africa in 2002, he holds a South African LLB degree from UNISA and a South African LM degree from UCT. In 2021, he was awarded a PhD degree by the University of Cape Town for his thesis entitled Equity in Higher Education Partnerships, defining the concepts in diversity context. He is a non-practicing attorney of the High Court of South Africa. Dr. Hagamaya, welcome and thank you. I hope I, have not, I hope I have not skipped anyone because I don't want to make that mistake before we get started. Anyone who needs my to be introduced, I guess we are okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, obviously, Obviously, as I said, you may want to know who I am. Uh, my name is Munyara Zumshunga. As I said, I am your host. I am program director for the Africa Studies in the Center for Gender and Africa Studies at the University of the Free State. Um, I am a historian by training. That's my background. And I'm also interested in post-colonial and, and, and decolonial discourses. So uh, that's who I am. So I think we want to move to the, to, the, to, the, to the next step of our program. Okay. No, no. All right, um, allow me to kickstart this uh, uh, very important event in our calendar by uh, reflecting on the Africa Day Memorial Lecture that was given on Wednesday by Professor Mutlatsi Tawani in this venue. And the title of that lecture was Josias Philip Hoffman and Mosheshwe the first friendship in the search for justice in the Mohokare Valley in the 19th century. So I'm just going to make reflections. I'm not going to summarize the lecture, otherwise we will be here the whole night. First, Professor Tawani emphasized that his lecture was a simple story of human relations, which was not loaded with any major meta-narratives. He chose a very difficult moment in the history of our region and in the history of human interactions in the 19th century, a moment that was characterized by animosities, suspicion, 
and enmity between two communities, Basutu on one hand, and a group of white settlers who had started arriving in the Mohoka Levari on the other hand. And they started to compete for land, that resource which is the foundation of all human production and reproduction. As we all know, land is home to the living and to the non-living. It is the source of water, it is the source of all minerals, it is the source of agriculture, it is the source of everything, and it is the source of life. So who were these two leaders who became great friends? These were Murena, as I have already said, Moshe the I and Josiah Hoffman, both of whom were committed to peaceful coexistence. The two men went out of their way to maintain peace and to avoid war and conflict, even when there were enough grounds for peace, for war and conflict. These two men had unique personalities and were men of great standing. They loved peace. For instance, in 1840, Moshe told his people, I love only peace. And this was echoed by his best friend, Hoffman, who also told one British official that so long as Moshe lives, there will never be war. So it was love. It was the love for the paradigm of peace against the paradigm of war that made these two great friends. A friendship that was hated by the majority of white settlers who worked hard to sabotage that friendship. Professor Tawani concluded that it could have been this, a personality amenable to moral persuasion and unwarlike that made Hoffman become friends with Mushweshwe. So Professor Tawani challenged us through Mosheshwe and Hoffman that it was possible and that it is possible more so in our century to shift from the paradigm of enmity and war into a paradigm of unity, friendship, peace, and love. The two men showed that it was possible to replace narcissistic love with decolonial love. And for me, the most important takeaway was that these two men represented people who were interested in peace and love for their people and for themselves. And that still those of us in the 21st century desire the same. So Moshe the I and Hoffman had the courage and wisdom to love and make peace under conditions that did not permit love and peace. But once Hoffman was impeached and forced to resign as president of the Free State in February 1855, eight months after being elected into office, all prospects of peace were removed. His impeachment was a major setback in the search for peaceful coexistence and prosperity for all in the region. So after 1855, the region ended a long period of conflict, war, animosity, and competition for resources, even leading to bloodshed, suffering. Thank God the world bequeathed us again with two other men, Nelson Olishasha Mandela and F.W. de Klerk, who seemed to have followed into the footsteps of Hoffman and Mosheshwe and worked hard to bring us peace in 1994. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the message that I have for you from that lecture. And I think it is possible under conditions that are difficult to make peace and love. It is still possible because Mandela declared Moshe the first and Hoffman did it. Thank you very much. Africa. <laughs> Mas
Tela kaloku mukaka kwe tu. Ewe kaloku le misambi ya lusok matela shuka shuka ne. Madi kala le kuku na di kala kaka kuli kaka zinga kizalo diti. Dingu kubu shuma chalum pako muno kachu maka ne saba ma walu kuzala. Uko tena kubu shaba chana bom tuakaz. Ufa sabela linya kapeche kumfu. Dizalo, ileto bika vunde, upa ukecha, umlu, utamshorelo, umezam shope, unyake mnyamika dizisi biwale lenga peshe, umkante na zintike mafi. La tutu misulu, babaleka matana be Afrika, batika la kuit kona zesi. Nenzi baza. Si chapasi zinga ngesi kwasa setu, tina mzotudu, tina mzika palo, tina sizikula na sika yinza. Cho, nja kumbuna, nge chosha la mandu. Chosha elu tasi ngina loka, diti ndisa kubiki saba, diti ndisa kubiki toko, atu makumu, atu tamkumu, mzukumu, yemba, na kumshonyana, usele, ukabla puka fini, ushia la makete, kubaka lukumu. Likasha, lekululeko. Diteta, ngekasha. Luluazi lwe ngado. Uluazi lwe mvelo. Abatabili mkuku ibiza is an indignous knowledge. Oh, nani pina? Ngekasha la matombe ngubi kliyo. E hamba esisha nguku standa kubaka luku. Ingekasha, isuke kaya. Diteta ngekasha la matota. Abafana bebi nishani. Baga kubi bebi nishawe. Oh, Mr. Zundu, did you must be a lamb for my Africa? Must be a lamb for my Africa. Nitetu, Nikoto, Mille, Ninukile, Queen Fundis was a West, Miss Libel, Infundis was a set, Miss Libel, and Kanoko, Queen Fundis was on Sigapano. Oh, Sigapano, La Pana, Lunis, when you kept Tamile. Nisena kukuka na sezi ketama, tos ngena bani. Ah, pama siko eni. Zipi stete zeni. Oh! Makawe, nani makawe kasi? Tisa ukita, tikwe, tinyatele, kubaka loku. Eya kamkozi, ya suwa ngomeza. Nditini na. Aisha, liku, litema mukbona. Une chebenge, une jana. Le yako ya disintobi, isayo kusela mati. Ditipuyele mati ni kenta mkubu wa kelele. Deha. Thank you very much. Am I okay? Uh, thank you very much. Now I want to ask uh, C. Banje Mabaso to come on the stage. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, I will be presenting a thought piece on promoting and appreciating language in and from Africa. So it is centered on the recognition and celebration of African produced knowledge and a conversation about our contribution globally on an equal footing. Right, so it's a bit lengthy, but please bear with me. Right. So in the Tony Award winning Broadway musical, The Color Purple, originally written as a novel by Alice Walker, the characters pay homage to Africa in a song titled African Homeland by expressing how they are happy at the center of the universe. These characters express in great detail the joy that they find in the anatomy of Africa, its shape, its form, its people, and the fruit of its soil. These characters see Africa and being African as an identity to which they are happy to subscribe. They show us a joy that we should all share the joy of being happy and content in the center of our universe, Africa, and to invest and indulge in all that it has to offer. Our general ideas about African-produced knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems are heavily influenced by Western indoctrination. 
As a result, Western thought presents itself as succeeding African knowledge as the only acceptable worldview, further dictating practices within Africa and the general way of life dating all the way back to colonialism. Thus, African knowledge finds itself playing second fiddle to other forms of epistemology and is thus perceived as being barbaric, as being mambo jumbo, or simply lacking intellect or reason. However, the reality is that Africa in itself has always been a self-sufficient home that is rich in culture, resources, and most importantly, knowledge. In an article about African indigenous knowledge systems and relevance of higher education in South Africa, Hassan Kaya and Yona Saleti introduce a compelling perspective that helps to frame our communal and collective understanding of African knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems, as well as our misconceptions thereof. According to Kaya and Saleti, Nkondo argues that the Western perception of African indigenous knowledge as mere repetition of practices without any theory to explain them is a depiction of Western cultural and intellectual arrogance. In the perception of African scholars, a traditional healer who is able to cure a particular disease using specific herbs has the knowledge and theory of the plant species and their characteristics. Masruri, another theorist, elaborates further the limited Western conceptualization of scholarship, education, and thus knowledge that stresses that in order to be scholarly and scientific implies being free from external interference, especially community engagement and political demands. Further emphasizing the point that African knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems are self-sufficient, but have throughout history been built on foundations that juxtapose those that are true to African societies. Haya and Seleti get to the root of the problem and propose that. The basic problem is that educational structures inherited from colonialism are based on cultural values different from those existing within African indigenous systems, or societies rather. The lack of relevance is perpetuated by the continued social, economic, and technological ties between African countries and their former colonizing powers. In brief, knowledge as perpetuated by the West has led to an incongruence and a deeply rooted invalidation of indigenous knowledge systems, as well as knowledge produced within Africa. So what do we do? I believe that our main prerogative as scholars is to dig deep. Our work, conversations, as well as our daily lives should be an inquiry that unpacks history and its influence on the present, thus leading us to find ways in which a bright and diverse future can be built for all. With that being said, I believe that it is our prerogative as Africans who are scholars, who live in the center of the universe and eat from the African soil, is to not only dig deep like other scholars do, but to capture the essence of Africa and its diaspora. It's important that we engage with the lived experiences and beliefs of our forefathers through text, artifacts, folklore, and so on and so forth, as well as engaging with those who are older and wiser than us. And most importantly, by documenting and passing down that knowledge and creating archives that not only celebrate our knowledge systems, but those that aim to restore what has been lost. Additionally, it is pivotal that we also interrogate grand narratives and challenge what we have been taught to be absolute truths, the truth with a capital T. And sooner than we know it, the song African Homeland from the color purple and the words, we are happy in the center of the universe will ring truer than ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sibanja Maposo was actually preparing the waterbed and the seedbed for a very warm, warm welcome from the rector and vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor Peterson. Okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, program director. Um, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, um, fellow Africans. I welcome you to the 2023 Africa Day Dialogue Session. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Sandhu Hira. Uh, welcome, sir. Secretary of the Decolonial International Network, and also his wife, Sitla Hira. Welcome to you as well. Uh, responsible for publications in the Decolonial International Network. I, um, 
I was informed that we also have in the audience Professor Rob Morel. He's uh, from the University of Cape Town, senior research fellow, and he's visiting our university as an external evaluator of the USDP uh, project in global health. And then we also, also want to welcome David Osita Uwa, who is the chairman of the Black Management Forum here in the Free State. So welcome, welcome to you. I acknowledge the presence of uh, members of our university executive and other senior management, our staff and our students. And I particularly welcome those who traveled from the Kwakwa campus to be part of this dialogue. And I specifically, our, our, our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Pearl Sitole, and we will hear a little bit later what Pearl is gonna be sharing with us. And I also greet everyone who has joined us online. So this week, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the founding of the Organization of African Unity. So across the continent, commemorations remind us of the African Union vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. The day reminds us of the pan-Africanist ideal in the quest for African unity. So across the continent, many higher education institutions reflect on the progress made in working towards African unity. It has become part of the DNA of the University of the Free State to celebrate Africa Day, Africa Week, and Africa Month. This year, we have once again arranged a multitude of activities. The diverse and multifaceted events highlight our university's commitment to epistemic diversity, which is a central tenet of our university's strategy encapsulated in Vision 130. It emphasizes the value of diversity of ideas, of perspectives, and of methodological approaches. This is what we embrace and practice through our multifaceted Africa Month activities. And I want to say thank you for the organizers uh, of this event and all of the other events that happen uh, across our campus. Uh, I was um, lucky to, uh, to participate in some discussions at the University of, the, of Pretoria on Africa Day. Uh, so I flew in this morning. We had a whole discussion yesterday. And the focus on the Africa Day discussions there yesterday um, was on open science. Uh, um, and what it actually means for Africa. So we had about five vice chancellors and academics from across the UK and Europe. They participated with other vice chancellors locally. Also the former vice chancellor from Pretoria, Cheryl de la Rey, flew in from New Zealand. So it was a, it was a fantastic deliberation of not only talk about Africa Day or Africa Month, in fact, Africa Day 25th is often being uh, 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 rated as Africa Day, uh, but it, it's a, it is about what does knowledge mean? Knowledge from Africa, knowledge within the global knowledge, and how do we challenge uh, uh, different perspectives? How do we make sure that ultimately when we talk about knowledge infusion, why is that important? It should always focus on social justice and should always focus to deal with the issues of inequality. If your knowledge integration, different perspective, epistemic engagement doesn't resolve that aspect, then I think we should ask the question, why are we doing it? So it was, the, the, the question was about not only collaboration and infusion, but about radical collaboration, a radical effusion, and, and, and look at different open science, open resources, uh, open data, uh, to make sure that the knowledge of Africa is embedded where it actually should be, 
But further than that, what is the knowledge of Africa supposed to be doing in the context of global knowledge? So that was, that was very, very interesting. So during this year's African commemoration year at the, at the university, we focus on promoting knowledge in and from Africa. The theme is central to what we want to deliver, what we want to see coming out uh, through our Vision 130, which includes a strong focus on strengthening our university as a contributor to the development of the African continent. But more than that, it is also to share what the continent has with the rest of the world. So what I would like to challenge our academic project at the University of the Free State is that when we have Africa Month here next year again, I would like to have to cite about three or four examples where we have co-teaching where some of our students were sitting in the same class as were students with other parts of the globe, taught by uh, uh, um, uh, academics from both our university and a university abroad, so that we start to make inroads in what we believe that knowledge sharing, that knowledge infusion should be about. But we had many inspiring engagement during this week. A multitude of commemorations organized by faculties, departments, centers, and also the Institutional Student Representative Council and other university stakeholders demonstrate our university's commitment to advancing Africa uni unity. Please allow me to mention a few highlights of the University of the Free State Africa Month. On Monday, Sandhu Hira, uh, here sitting behind me, launched his book, Decolonal Decolonizing the Mind, and, um, and I heard I'm gonna get a copy later on, so that's probably uh, uh, for my reading at some point, and shared with us his approach towards decolonizing disciplines. Sandhu shared his vision to make the transition from colonial universal world civilization to a new world civilization by decolonizing the mind and creating a new knowledge base that draws on old civilizations. We look forward to him sharing further reflections on this theoretical approach later today. Our program director already shared uh, his reflections on this year's Africa Day Memorial Lecture, which Professor Modlatsi Tabane from our neighboring university, uh, National University of Lesotho, where uh, um, uh, he, in fact, as a fantastic scholar, uh, presented the Africa Day Memorial Lecture here on our campus. I appreciate that a scholar from the National University of Lesotho joined us. This is another expression of flourishing partnership between our higher education institutions. And uh, it's great, we visited uh, the University of Lesotho, National University of Lesotho, during the course of last year, and we signed a, an agreement between the two universities where different academics uh, and projects we're gonna do together. Uh, um, and uh, besides this particular lecture, the Africa Day Memorial Lecture, there is also gonna be later on the Masweshwa Lecture that we will probably also try to, 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 to see whether we can partner. We have curated an Africa Month website to share our diverse activities, thought leaders and artistic expression engaging uh, with this year's theme. And last year, we discussed in the Africa Day Dialogue series, <clears throat> in this dialogue series, the contribution of African education to African unity. I remarked that Africans' knowledge should be infused and put on the same pedestal as what we would call global knowledge or knowledge from the North. This year's Africa Day Dialogue picks up on this theme and takes the debate beyond education into knowledge generation. So today we will explore the theme promoting and appreciating knowledge in and from Africa through artistic expression and academic dialogue. And we already have seen some, some of the artistic expression uh, uh, um, 
and uh, I presume there's going to be, be going to be more of that. So distinguished guests and colleagues, I hope that today's dialogue session will contribute to the quest for Africa unity and assist us in developing new ideas for promoting African knowledge globally. Thus, I hope that we will be able to work towards ensuring that knowledge in and from our continent, Africa, will take its rightful, prominent place in the world and ultimately to make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rector, for that uh, beautiful message to let us know and everyone know that uh, knowledge should not just be knowledge for its sake per se, but it should resolve to solve our daily problems in our lives. And if we send our knowledge to solve problems, then we will be on the right path. Thank you very much for that beautiful message and we really appreciate that. And thank you for the warm welcome to everyone. Um, allow me to invite our next speaker here, for just five minutes. If, if, if you donate a minute to me, I'll be very grateful. Uh, on the subject of promoting and appreciating knowledge in and from Africa, indigenous and scholarly knowledge. This message is coming from none other than Mr. Mklambiso. Over to you, sir. So much, uh, Doc. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, good afternoon, everyone. You know, when uh, Doc, you were introducing me, um, there's something that we didn't tell everybody is that I am an African. Um, sometimes I wish I could just speak in my home language, but since Africa is a diverse, is a diverse continent, I prefer to speak in a universal language so that everyone who is here from different nations can hear and understand and feel so welcomed in Africa. In Africa, I was born and bred. It is my motherland. It is my homeland. It is where I live. It is where the bones of my great grandfathers have been laid and rested, where their richness is, where you will find their livestock and crops. The kings of tribes and tribes of Africa, they make me and dress me like an ornament. I'm talking about the, the people of King Inza, those who were there bathed so shamelessly. Oh, the people of Queen Mutreshwe, your blankets are so prominent. Even when I cross the borders of the country, cross the borders of the continent, I always take one with me. Whenever the sun sets for me, wherever it sets for me, I sleep. Oh, Zulu, Zulu, you are Zulu, you are so fearful. When I land in Australia and in Europe, I wear your tiger skin and carry a sagila, and everybody starts shouting, he's an African, he's an African, he's from Africa. Sometimes I dance in the streets of Asia, and everybody starts shouting, African dance, African dance. Oh, teach me that one, I'm loving it. I'm an African, Dingum Africa, African Africana, Africa. Good afternoon, everyone, once again. Talk, talk, may you please do not cut me. I know maybe I will take more than five minutes. But mine is so brief, um, ladies and gentlemen, just to, um, before uh, sometimes you suggest, you have to first appreciate and promote as our theme today, indigenous and scholarly knowledge. You know, each and every country, however a continent in this context, Pride itself in what it has, what it does or produces, ranging from its cultural customs, traditions, minerals, and other resources, or production that it has or can produce. And so does Africa. Thus, today, it is a good thing to keep on promoting and appreciating while valuing and commemorating how great and excellently those who came before us have carried the legacies of great knowledge and pass it on to those who are with us today. It is not a lie, ladies and gentlemen, nor hearsay, that Africa is not only rich in natural resources, but also rich in knowledge. In this context, I will say, indigenous knowledge and practices that it has and contributes globally. 
In Africa, we have so many tribes that pride themselves about their cultures. You can see this during the, 20, uh, during the Heritage Day celebration in South Africa on the, 21st, uh, on the 24th sorry, of September. Acts like these, they show us that those who celebrate themselves in South Africa, celebrate their cultures, are responsible citizens of the country, of the continent. Being a, a responsible citizen is, is when you take an initiative to say, I'm proud of being an African. This is what we do in Africa. This is where I come from. Especially South Africa, the Rainbow Nation in particular, it is very influential, as can be seen in other countries within Africa, such as Egypt, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, just to name a few, priding and practicing their cultures. It also contributes to the economy of each country on the, on the continent. If, in, we, if we, were go, we, were, we, were, we were to go to a tourism um, content, you would understand when we talk about contributing towards the economy uh, of the country. However, we're still proud of our icons and attractions. Someone who did tourism would relate to that content. That is how impactful Africa is. Now, it um, would be so wrong of me if I, can put, if I can put it that way, not mentioning our local knowledge, our initiatives that are being taken by our universities in South Africa, abroad Africa. In a scholarly context, some of the South African universities, namely the University of the Free State, the Central University of Technology, and the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and others are currently working towards an approach to integrate different native or indigenous languages into their teaching and learning spaces, while some are already implementing it. This is one of the good motives for approaching or having an Africanized curriculum. You would put it in a way and say, a, de a decolonized curriculum in higher institutions. However, it would be more than a prestigious movement, but a total impactful one, if this kind of learning and teaching could also be implemented in primary institutions. When I talk about primary institutions, I'm referring to the foundation where we all started. We started leaning back in, the, uh, uh, in primary institutions in the basic, uh, uh, the department, uh, basic department of education. If, if, if these projects or these kinds of movements could also be implemented there, and so that we can be able to close the gap between the higher institutions and the basic department. Now, I would like to take some few quotes, a few words, if I can put it in that way from um, one of our academic leaders, if, uh, uh, if I can put it in that way, Dr. Piet van Eder and Dr. Kolani Kotliso. Uh, Dr. Piet van Eder uh, is a lecturer and a coordinator from the Academy for Multilingualism in the University of the Free State. He commented on one of the multilingual books published by the project. He said, open quote, the project is a response from the center to ever increasing need for you can take note of this, whether I'm going to call a phrase, if you can put it that way, decolonize the curricula. Steep the in the now. You can also take note of this one. Local cultural perspective of Ubuntu, close quote. Moving to Dr. Hotliso, a curriculum and academic staff developer from the Central University of Technology. He commented on the publication of terminology for engineering fields in Sesotho by a CUT alumnus, Mr. Hotu Mutwahaya, saying, open code, now you can take note of this one, integrating African languages into, and also this one, academic research, teaching and learning can advance knowledge production. And if we're in the context of basic uh, education, it can enhance learner performance and dissemination, make it more accessible to local communities and promote more inclusive research. Close quote. Um, the way paved by such projects and movements, it gives us an opportunity as the youth of Africa to take charge of the invaluable 
and transformation that we would like to see our continent and country's education, education system becoming. They might be regarded as minor changes, but they are taking us one step closer to the Africa we are trying to build. Now, I'm about to conclude, Prof. I'm sorry for taking your time. Uh, there has also been a great appreciation, which is this one's the closest to my heart, which uh, when I read about it, I was like, we are moving forward. We are being recognized in Africa. The appointment of the former vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, Prof. Chelizi Marwala, as the rector and the principal of the United Nations um, in Tokyo, Japan, which is one of the greatest and a must archive appointment in the history. The reason is that it has proven that African knowledge is of great value and significance for the devel development of other continents. Thus, it should, be, uh, it should be shared and spread globally. This is not just an appointment, but a recognition of knowledge um, in and from Africa. I'm about to conclude, Prof. I'm sorry. Um, in addition, you know, there is nothing that amuses someone's heart or your neighbor's heart when your neighbor, uh, when your child's neighbor coming to your, um, to your yard and play and you're like, oh, they find comfort here. It's, um, it's their comfort zone or they see the significance of playing around my yard. Now, in addition, seeing international students enrolling and feathering their studies in Africa is one of the convincing um, facts in this point that uh, Africa is not only rich in natural resources, but also rich in knowledge. Which, in, in this point, I would advise that or suggest that let's indulge those who come internationally, let's indulge, let's also indulge them to our indigenous languages. Let's also teach them our indigenous languages. Let them speak our Isisulu. Let them speak our Sesotho. You get the point. I hope that is clear. It's clear that I'm almost done, Prof. I'm sorry. But also rich in knowledge, which has a huge, remarkable impact on other continents and their citizens. Now, the question is who would cross um, oceans to acquire knowledge that is common, not impactful? No one. That would be my response. And in conclusion, Prof, uh, working towards an Africanized <laughs> continent will require the leaders, including our academic leaders of the countries that are in Africa, and us as the youth to look at what has been done and how it has been done while looking at what could be done, what could be done and how it could be done. In thank this you. context, thank, you thank, say we are, you, much, so we are decolonizing, we have, we are decolonizing our curriculum. I'm almost done, Prof. We have Q&A session, so we, you will send your message. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you thank, so much, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, we really appreciate your message, and uh, I, I, I am thrilled of course, you know, you, you took a bit of time, but I'm thrilled that you have a message to send to everyone. So that is very important. I'm happy for that. But to the rest of the panelists, if you see me standing up for the first time, I'm just saying one minute to go. If I stand up for the second time, I'm just saying to the technician, please, it's time. <laughs> right, thank you. We are moving on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Kangosi. Uh, Dr. Kangosi. He has a beautiful message to share with us. The topic of his talk, five minutes on the dot, reads Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Heritage. Got, oh, sorry, 15, sorry. Uh, 15 minutes, one five, sorry. Uh, indigenous Knowledge Systems and Heritage Contribution of South Africa to the world's creative economy industry and incorporation of indigenous epistemology in education. Please feed us. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. In this presentation, I'll be appreciating the contribution of South African cultural and creative industry on the world stages and highlighting the influence of indigenous knowledge system therein. Furthermore, I will be advocating for the importance of inclusion of some indigenous knowledge system in the education system. Indigenous knowledge system in Africa is and was still embedded in the daily lives and, and the worldview of indigenous Africans as opposed to scholarly based learning. Therefore, knowledge is shared via languages, idioms, performing arts, spiritual practices, rites of passage, cultural celebration, and recreational activities. 
The understanding and definition of knowledge to me as an African is based on the African epistemology passed to us by our ancestors from generation to generation. Unfortunately, coloniality and so-called Western civilization, Western understanding of science within the framework of global knowledge in all spheres and fraternities, from the basic education schooling system right up to the academic research sphere. An advocate and research expert on decoloniality in post-colonial studies by the name of Prof. Ramon Crossfugel uh, refers to this unfortunate destruction and ignoring, and ignoring other knowledge systems of the world as epistemic genocide. The school science curriculum content will, for example, teach African learners that there are eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, of which, by the way, they are named after Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. In contrary, they never teach them that, according to African indigenous knowledge systems, we believe in three different spaces. We have umhlaba, earth, or world of the living. Umkat, a spiritual world where the spirits reside. And ngapans umhlaba, underneath the earth, the ancestral world. Therefore, there is a gap for African indigenous astronomy knowledge. To further give an example, most schools, they indirectly indoctrinate African children with Christianity and expose them to other religions, such as Islam and Judaism, etc., but they do not tell them about African spirituality. For an example, they would not teach them about, they will teach them about Jesus Christ and his disciples, and never about the African indigenous deities, gods, and goddesses, such as Queen Mutalipula, who's the Peri Rain Queen, and Umvelingangi, the supreme deity, the creator of all things on earth. In an academic publishing world, it is very difficult to reference a traditional healer, for instance, or Isanusi, which is the highest ranking prophet in an African indigenous system like the late Ubabu Credo Mutwa, or your elders as your source, simply because the academics don't know them as academics or researchers. Therefore, they do not value their knowledge contribution and categorize it under unsigned, unscientific whilst they mean that they do not acknowledge other ways of knowing except the Western classification of scientific. They snap the fact that indigenous knowledge system is also based on spiritual visions and ancestral knowledge passed down by our elders to the youth. Even though there are deliberate transformation agendas and programs, there are still a few stubborn roots that refuse to be pulled out of their comfort zone. A personal example, in the year 2022, I got a complaint from some students that I am focusing too much on African-based education approaches, which they felt it is redundant. I interpreted that as the refusal of decolonizing the curriculum, which I figuratively refer to as singing transformative, inclusive melody without the rhythm. Rites of passages, rites of passages sites in indigenous knowledge system are educational cultural learning spaces where knowledge about the history and the genealogy of your clan is taught. For example, you learn about your people's tribe traditions, migration history, kings and chiefs of your clans, your related surnames and your totems. All this historical education is done through clan praise names. We learn artistically and through songs and praise poetry which are referred to as creative performance-based learning. This cultural, history is mis uh, this cultural history is missing in our school history curriculum and could be said that it is an oral story that has not been written down and can't be referenced. However, we should ask ourselves as Africans if the term illiterate and unscientific knowledge is what we should accept when a non-African indigenous people label our cultural heritage and indigenous knowledge systems. Is promotion and preservation only done through documentation? I ask myself. I think one of the indigenous knowledge heritages that we should promote and put out there into the world stage is that we are a creative and uh, performing based education system that teaches us about our clan names, heritage, history. For an example, in the Nkosi clan, you would say Nkosi, Jamini, when Ogne, when Oltanga, Lorangwan, Shubilo Moshem Langen, Shubla Jesha Skalobamb, Nesitis Bajubula Sibes Bajubulisa, when Oluapakat Olbomb or Shashatel. Basically, this tells you that the Nkosis migrated from the north and they used the Lubombo River, and they were, they, they are descendants, of, descendants of the royalty, and they settled in Swaziland, which their capital city is Lobamb. 
It is therefore very important that we as young and young youth and young academics must influence education policies through advocacy and critical engagement with the relevant gatekeepers in both basic schooling and tertiary level to transform the curriculum and to sincerely incorporate indigenous knowledge systems. We should first clean our house before we invite guests to come to appreciate it. For Africa to be respected and appreciated by the world, we need to affirm and instill self-confidence and celebrate what makes us African and unique. As an African idiom says, let's go back to our, to, our, to our roots or to our indigenous ancestral ways. We should not shy away from our African indigenous practices, beliefs, and knowledge. If we fail to do so, we will always be taken as a step human of the world who mimic and are gatekeepers of Western knowledge system. It's a, it's a course expression that translates to your inheritance is being stolen from you. In this instance, it can be translated or interpreted as your indigenous cultural heritage will be overlooked by Western knowledge uh, Western knowledge systems if you don't protect, preserve, and promote it. It is still evident and a public knowledge that some of our cultural heritage, such as scientific discoveries, some body parts of our deities, and stolen natural resources still lie in Western museums, and Africans still pay to date uh, for their stolen goods by paying to go into those museums to museums to see their stolen property. Rhetorically, in 2022 and 2023, some African statesmen and dignitaries flew to the United Kingdom to be part of the audience of the funeral and coronation of our former colonizer, who refused to bring back the gold and diamonds they stole from our continent. I'm wondering whether there will be ever a similar delegation that would be sent to the former colonizers to negotiate for the repatriation of African indigenous cultural heritage, heritage including our minerals. Mining has always been part of indigenous industrial knowledge system. Our ancestors refined gold and diamond and decorated their royalties. The economic value of those precious African indigenous minerals brings to the world should be known and appreciated by the world. It is also part of the knowledge that our future generation must be aware of, that we had African indigenous mining skills and knew the value of those minerals before the colonizers came and claimed that they discovered it and used their high-tech machinery to exploit it. It does not make sense to me that the world deems us uh, as the country or the continent which is poor and should be given loans by the International Monetary Fund, instead of telling the world to repay us for what it, uh, that what it has been stolen from us and acknowledging us as an e economic powerhouse that enables the global economy to go around. Reparations are long overdue for what the world has stolen and took from Africa. Our vast, distinct, our vast, distinct cultural, creative, and performing art excellence has seen African musicians competing in the world performing stages and brought gold trophies back to Africa. That proves the fact that gold belongs to us naturally. This, is demo this demonstrated competency and showed off the exceptional artistic skills that we possess as indigenous Africans. The likes of the contemporary Stratamia music whereby the Ladysmith Black Mambas have won five Grammys since 1986. In house music, where we have Zakes Bantwini and Blake Coffey, who won the Grammys in 2022. Nduduzo Makatini, the South African Afro jazz pianist, first black and only South African, who signed a record label with Blue Note Production, which is a home of legends such as John Coltrane and the Thessalonians Monk. Priti Ende, sang in Coronation of Prince Charles 2023, this knowledge should be shared and celebrated within our continent and beyond. We should celebrate the achievements and contribution of our cultural and creative industry to the global creative economy. The knowledge of communicating with our ancestors through music is one of the things that we, the world should know about us. Our arts are not only for entertainment, but that some of them are sacred and spiritual. Hence, they should be respected and not be filmed and televised without the consent of the indigenous people. There are documentaries and research material on African spiritual music or arts which were done during colonial times which disrespect African culture and have been done unethically. They were recorded without the knowledge of owners and are being turned into financial benefit for others. Those should also be brought back home, reclaimed from the museums and libraries and archives. We also must make sure that we register the correct intellectual property rights to them 
and should benefit the original creators of the content. Our indigenous knowledge system of architecture, science, and mathematics are of the highest standard, and no other knowledge has tried to copy them or surpass their scientific configurations and mathematical formulas. The Egyptian pyramids have been, have been built by hand and remain standing for centuries. The underground temples of Ethiopia have been built using indigenous knowledge system of architecture. The Ndebele artwork of Goko Estamashangu is not only about the colors, but demonstrate high skill levels of mathematics, geometry, soft science skills of indigenous African communicative visual arts. Mashangu never went to school to be trained, as an artist, she learned from the elders. Excellence in arts education has always existed in indigenous knowledge systems. The magnificent sculptures of Pitigarantuli and the poetic sculptures of Gokonoria Mabasa further demonstrate that our knowledge of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics has been integrated when it comes to indigenous knowledge systems-based education. Our ancestors have always practiced the concept of STEAM pedagogy approach in education. STEAM pedagogy means or stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Dr. Mabasa was never taught the arts in school. She says she gets her ideas and concepts through ancestral revelation and dreams. Our ancestors are artistic. Our ancestors are artistic and communicate with us through the arts. The world should know about that. In conclusion, as you know, Isikosa, Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Songaniso Kangosi. We really appreciate the zeal and the message. And I think the message is, the theme is coming through, the importance of knowledge in and from Africa, starting with you know, our brother there. And so we really appreciate that. Now we want to hear from our external visitor, Sandu Yira, to tell us about the importance of being creators of knowledge in and from Africa. Over to you, Sandu. Thank you, Munya. Thank you, Professor Peterson and the UFS community for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Cornelius, uh, for International Affairs who made, you know, uh, received me here, the Center for Gender and African Study who, you know, exposed me to so much of the, the culture and the history and the warmth and love and the intellectual simulation. Thank you for having me here. Um, the challenge for uh, knowledge creation in Africa, you could understand the challenge if you put it in an international context and see that what is discussed here about the relevance of African knowledge is discussed in India about the relevance of Indian knowledge. It's discussed in Iran, in Saudi Arabia about the relevance of Islamic civilization. It's discussed in China about the resurgence of Confucianism. So these discussions have to do with the big challenge of the European enlightenment that have discarded knowledge from other civilization as being uh, 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 irrelevant, inferior to European knowledge. And if now you want to articulate a response to the European knowledge production, then you should take into account that you are articulating a response to the policies that comes from that knowledge. So you can't discuss knowledge production without discussing the political and policy implications of knowledge production. Now you have two strategies, in my opinion, of how to deal with these challenges. One strategy is to avoid the confrontation with the European Enlightenment and then go for epistemic diversity, meaning you don't attack the validity of the European knowledge, you claim your own validity and say this is valid knowledge. There's another strategy that confronts the European Enlightenment and its policies, and it is 
an offensive strategy. It says, your knowledge is invalid. Your idea of how to run an economy is invalid. Your idea of how to run political institution is invalid. There were other ideas formulated in other civilizations that is worthwhile talking about now. Now, which strategy is the best depends on the practical circumstances in a country or an institution. There's not one strategy for every institution. <coughs> but I go for the strategy that the Decolonial International Network has chosen for criticizing the validity of Eurocentric knowledge production. And it comes, for example, with terminology. Why do we talk about indigenous knowledge as if knowledge is, other knowledges are not indigenous? Why is Eurocentric knowledge not indigenous? Eurocentric knowledge is the knowledge of Europe. It's indigenous knowledge. So my, my point of view is that using terms as indigenous knowledge gives you the idea if it's a, as if it's a different kind of knowledge than the standard knowledge. So in order to be able to elevate African knowledge, Indian knowledge, uh, knowledge of Abiyayala, Latin America term for, that the indigenous people in Latin America use for, for their continent, in order to go there, we need to move from general notions about decolonial theory, decoloniality, African knowledge. Uh, uh, we need to move from those general things to the specifics. We need to move to the disciplines and say, what is an African theory of economics? Because that theory will tell us what policies follows from that African theory of economics. What is an African uh, Islamic theory, social theory, of how to look at the construction of society and society, social relations with nature? If you don't succeed in making that transition, your students will tell you, what are you teaching me? Some generality, but what can I do it practically with it? We need practical tools from theory in order to make theory relevant. And here's the thing, it is perfectly possible. And I'll give you a few examples. Take the basis of knowledge, epistemology, the theory of knowledge, logic. If you take, for example, the, the basis of logic in Europe, in Eurocentric knowledge, is the logic of Aristotle, formal logic. That logic tells you that, that A is A, Columbus is Columbus, uh, 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 Columbus is not a dog. There's a, there's a system there, right? In the uh, one, one philosopher, um, Victor Okaya, studied the language of the Akoli people of Southern Sudan and saw how in that language, the logic of Aristotle didn't apply. Because in that language, uh, they have, for example, uh, 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 the idea, uh, it is hot, uh, it is not hot, uh, and these are the two exclusive things. But the language, I think, there's something that is hot and not hot, is rather hot. That type of logic, Okai argues, resembles the logic of Jainism in India, which says the outcome of logic is not true and false only, like in the Aristotelian logic, but has seven values. You can be dead, you can be alive, and you can be dead and alive. How can you be dead and alive? If your heart stopped beating, but your brain is, thing, is still functioning, you could do reanimation, and then suddenly you, you, have, you can be dead and alive. Malik Badri in Sudan, questions social theory and says the way social theory in the West looked at human beings is like social objects, meaning 
like the natural scientist studies natural object, the social scientist also social object. So human beings are reduced in object, it's dehumanization. If you do that, what happens? The person studying that object is divorced from the object, while the object is human being, and claims the position of objectivity. Social sciences are objective. So he, he goes into the discussion with Max Weber, who purported in sociology that, uh, uh, that social sciences should be objective. So this is African knowledge on a discipline. Oyumi Ororenko <coughs> questions the theory of gender. And she argues, gender is based on the concept of the relationship between men and women. What if in a language like the Yoruba language, there's no term for men and women, for father and mother, for daughter and son? What if that is the case? Where does gender theory leave us? Take mathematics, what you think might not be able to decolonize. In mathematics, you can see a difference between mathematics that have evolved in Europe and mathematics that have evolved outside of Europe. The difference is that in Europe, they develop the system of axioms. Axioms are proposition without proof. So you re rebuild a, a, a system without proof you can create fantasies, and if you do that, you can get st strange things. For example, if I ask you, what is one plus two plus three plus four till infinity, you, you might think, if I give you one dollar, two dollar, three dollar, you're immensely rich. You know what the answer is in Eurocentric uh, uh, mathematics? It's one minus 12, meaning that if I give you one dollar, two dollar, three dollar, you end up in debt. That's the axiomatic approach of mathematics. In Africa, in the Egyptian mathematics, mathematics was not based on propositions, but empirical notion of counting. One plus one is one apple plus two apple, etc. It's not axiomatic. So the Eurocentric mathematics does not understand the concept of infinity. Infinity is not a representation of quantity. One and two is a representation of quantity. I give you this, you might think it's a bit complex, just to show you that we can build disciplines based on knowledge outside of Europe, taking into account the knowledge that has produced in Africa, Asia, etc., and reconstruct <coughs> science. It requires quite a step for the universities. It requires that you acknowledge that you need to be in a position of discussion and critique with Eurocentric knowledge and not move only to, hey, I claim my knowledge, but I don't discuss yours. I don't think the validity of yours. But in general, that is a true scientific approach. You discuss every opposition, uh, every theory uh, from every side. You engage in true science with, with views that you might not agree with. That is true science. Now, understand that we are now in a phase in world history where we see the rise of the West and the decline, the, the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. We see even in the war of Ukraine a massively changing economic, political uh, uh, world system. What we don't see yet is how we are moving from an old colonial world civilization which is based on the concept of universalism, that European knowledge is universal, what Europeans have thought about knowledge and produce economic, social, political theories, technology in knowledge has a universal validity. We're moving to a world where we say there's a multipolar world. In political and economic terms, it's multipolar. But every civilization, the basis of a civilization is knowledge, because the knowledge tells you how to structure your society. Islamic civilization is based on the Quran, tells you how to organize your society. Chinese civilization was based on Confucianism, and now the Communist Party has taken over. Read Xi Jinping's book about Confucius, going back to the Confucius and old Chinese philosophers how to read Confucius and other Chinese philosophers to restructure Chinese society. Now, 
in the new phase we are moving, the universities should be, in my view, in a position where they form the basis of a new world civilization, the basis of new knowledge structures. And it moves there if it's able to decolonize a discipline. So whenever now we are talking about African knowledge or decolonial knowledge, we should talk about what does it mean for social theory, for political theory? What does it mean how you run a country, how you run economy, how you run technology? And if you do that, and once you do that, for students, the relevance will be very practical because students will become consumers of knowledge, from consumers of knowledge to producers of knowledge. Because students could be you know, invited to, to build this new world civilization. It's a big challenge, but Confucius said, a journey of a thousand kilometers, a thousand miles, begins with the first step. And if we take the first step for the right track on the journey, we will reach that thousand miles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandu. We really appreciate that message and that uh, as you concluded that, uh, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step and we take away that very, very important message. We're going to have an artistic piece from our Department of Arts and uh, Culture at our beautiful university. They are going to warm our hearts. When the sun sets, the great storytellers tell us the tales of our African roots. And when 
when the sun sets, we listen. Wow, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Africa from north to east, from west to west, from south to south, from east of east, west of west, north of north. That's how beautiful our continent is. So rich, artistic music, artistic storytelling, telling the African story. Thank you very much. We really appreciate and we want to welcome our next 
speaker, our next uh, uh, speaker on the stage, who is none other than the Deputy Campus Principal of Kwakwa Campus, Professor Peel Stolle. And I think I heard you whispering to me that Sandu must visit our beautiful campus next time. Over to you, Prof. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Program Director. Certainly the best way to save the gentleman sitting on this side and this side of me is to make sure I have no podium and no table because I speak with my hands. <laughs> but <laughs> now that I don't have a podium, I will try and behave. Um, I will um, take cue from the acknowledgements that you have made and that the Vice um, Chancellor has made to greet everyone in the house without specifying designations. I am very happy to be here. I am fearful about my tendencies of my hands because I really am here to advance a persuasive argument. I'm passionate about this subject that I am going to be talking about, and I, I feel it is, it is long overdue to do, to jump from theory to practice about it. I actually, just perhaps to make a few opening remarks, think that the society is ahead of intelligentsia when it comes to a series of uh, phrases that we have put out there, namely the African Renaissance, decoloniality, Afrocentricity, and, and, and however way we have put it. Mm. And I feel that the society, we, we started off persuading the society, thanks to Nguki Wathiongo's phrase, persuading the society to heal and to accept the African society, that is, and to accept who that society is and the confidence that it must have on just being itself. Mm. I think the society has done that, actually. I mean, there are indications. I'm not saying that Africa is where it should be, but I am saying that in terms of being sure in terms of the confidence of being an African, they are there. But I am not sure that scholars, the academic, the sector of science and, and technology, the sector of innovation is there. And in fact, I would venture to accuse this particular sector of taking the society a few steps back and pulling it backwards a little bit instead of taking it forward. And I just want to <laughs> substantiate this argument, not because I want to damn our work, but hopefully by the end of this accusation to be able to say there are spaces where we definitely need to zoom into and and identify them as niche to correct and to contribute to pushing a society that has worked so hard forward. I, oh, okay, now I, I'm in a, in a dilemma of, um, of, of mismanaging my, <laughs> my, my script but I will be proceeding as I try to find it. Yeah, sure. I wanted to say, uh, Vice Chancellor, that the work of Dr. Hagen Meyer next to me here has led us to believe that we've started on the journey that you were pining for at UP. We have, in the recent months, maybe even years, been receiving guests who have been saying things to us, <laughs> and we have been listening very carefully to what it is that they are offering. Some of them haven't impressed us in the sense that they have come to say that we are about this and you can learn from us, which is fine. We, we are humble enough to learn. 
but there is nothing that actually says that we are partners in that particular setting. But one very interesting character, if I may call him that, came last year. I won't name, mention the, the, the country or, or, or the name, but he was a, an education attache of that country. And he said to us, um, uh, when he visited Kwakwa at least, I am here to talk to you about proposals that we can have in terms of a partnership. And since I have come here, particularly on a time when after COVID and we have all been experimenting and learning about how to do education virtually, I'm actually proposing that we do more, we take advantage of this experience and do most interaction equally in these platforms. Not only will this save us, but it will ensure better mileage in terms of the consistent interaction. Of course, we went to a whole discussion about what elements will be lost and how we can supplement this mainly virtual um, interaction. But the cut and long and, uh, story short, he eventually said to us at the when we were interacting with him, I am really doing this to try and boost the image of my country, which he mentioned by name, within the geopolitical space of knowledge, because we think we have a lot to offer through knowledge. Mm. A kind of frankness that amazed me. And we had some discussions about this, especially over mm. dinner. Mm. It was the first time that I had this kind of engagement acknowledge the self-centered interest of that particular stakeholder that he wants to boost the image of his country in the geopolitics of knowledge. In fact, I took him to task about this and I said, do you think that your country will be happy to have heard this particular statement? And he said, yes, I think it is overdue that we, are, we somewhat approach the terrain where our stakes are on the table. I am just mentioning this because I think that we have been agendaless. And in fact, I might have overstepped my mark in the confession myself because I did say to him that we are used to people who assume that all we ever want to do is to rub shoulders with them. And this is why I was amazed by your, your, your frankness. And in fact, I do think that many institutions come from that vulnerable stance of wanting to rub shoulders, not to rock the boat in case there is funding, and, 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 and we've got to be careful around relationships and not to be misunderstood when we are trying to challenge other stakeholders to communicate and deal with them on an equal footing. So I think that the first issue that we need to deal with is whether we have an agenda in the first place. Now, I know and appreciate the work that you were summarizing. I wasn't certainly at that particular lecture and all of the other work that suggests that we have got to be so careful as to uh, possibly um, be careful around relationships and preserving the peace, as well as being careful in the sense of trying to see where, how do we contribute to what is assumed to be generic knowledge. But at the same time, I see everyone as having an agenda, mm. but us. So, and, 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 and where I am headed is that it's not a bad thing to have an agenda, especially by this particular sector whose main mandate is to advance our society. We are done with confidence. We are there. 
That's what the artistic um, story shows us. That's what the appointments of kings and queens and all is, 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 is showing us. But we need to ask ourselves, what agenda do we have as Africa in the knowledge space to advance this particular continent? And so, Chair, I just want to briefly, uh, please, for me, uh, stand up at three minutes because there are important things that I need to do okay. at the end. I'll whisk to them. But I wanted to say that there has been amazing work that has brought us into this confidence at the periphery. And this, the space of the periphery, the space of informality is actually where we are at. We've, we are almost comfortable there, to a point where when the society gave up on us in the manner in which we handled COVID, they went on and on in the social media, sharing informality that will help them. And they were helped. They assisted each other because there was a particular view that says that these people, the intelligentsia, can take us up to this far. We need to help ourselves. We can't be like that. We would be a waste if we continued in that space without an agenda that favors Africa. I want to say that even in my own observation, and, and the, my observation is only a small piece in this, the space of informality, if you just cite South Africa, and in particular KZN where I was and come from when we were doing the spade work on confidence, you will find that there is work such as the work of Matole Motsecha, who is a politician, but he actually had amazing interest in, the, in what he called the Gara Institute mm -hmm. of studying all of the civilizations of Africa, and he could not shut up about that. I think he is possibly a person who influenced the others, including the former president, Thabo Mbegi, into being an Africanist, a self-proclaimed one, um, influence the former VC of, UK, of UKZN possibly into writing Africa. I actually started wondering whether he was studying other causes uh, other than <laughs> his, his science background because he was writing books on Afri of Africanity. I was happy to see the roads must fall contrary to what people might believe. And in particular, the the courage by Smok, Wabe, and crew in the UK to take it up there. Today we can even point to some inklings of repatriation of heritage by some of those universities there to countries like Berlin. It was after they ventured to do that. Spoon Debele, the former premier of KZN, did a lot of work. In, for, for, whenever there is a conference, we know that it must be about <laughs> African Renaissance. All of those are work of informality that the society allowed itself to imbibe in order for us to be where we are. Mm. I also know that patriarchy has not left us with all of that because there is a lot of women that were doing background work in all of those things. And there is a lot of work who are doing a lot of work um, in the academic space, in this field that we can't even um, uh, recognize because the field is not recognized. Mm. We'll talk about ratings and citations and whether it's realistic to cite, to expect citations to be fair when they are doing work that is not liked, but <laughs> the story for another day. <laughs> However, people like Professor Himonga of UCT on restorative justice, people like um, Professor Odora Hoppers, the last I checked, she was at UNISA, many others, all I am saying is that if you are in the formal space, the subject informalizes you. But nonetheless, they pursued, and this is why we are where we are. I also want to talk about a little bit about the fact that we are in a self-defeating space, in the space of decoloniality, and in the space of being 
living in the formal space of education and yet at the same time that is seeking to be a formalized space of education and yet at the same time um, being bugged down by the kind of lack of social cohesion that is in the space. In fact, we are more socially incohesive as academics, intelligentsia, than the society out there. Why? Because we want to define the African to its absolute certainty in terms of what the African is. But before I talk about our definition of the African, I want to talk about the bad example that we are if we talk about social um, cohesion. We have been fighting battles around inequality, but when it comes to patriarchy, <laughs> we are actually the best example of people who do not care for their own. The hierarchy is still, is still there. Um, if, you, if you look at the, 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 the units or the authorities that monitor us, whether it is DHET reports or it is NASA monitoring the issues around innovation, the black woman is always at the bottom. The black man is next, the white woman is next, and the old hierarchy exists. Now, how have we in the field that speaks social justice, that speaks all forms of scientific fairness, been able to maintain this and live with it consistently the way that we have? How? How is it possible that we're not drinking our own medicine? We are also um, lacking in terms of, um, of, of social cohesion in the manner in which we handle our diplomacy. And it speaks to my surprise at that education attache. Because what has happened is that you let the ambassador of the USA speak the way that he has been speaking, and then in, in, in wise trying to defend himself, tells us that they have given us money like PEPFA and, 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 and therefore imply that we should shut up. And we still don't do much to highlight the patronage that we should be uncomfortable with in the partnerships that we are formulating. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about the artificial intelligence issues, mm -hmm. which we like very much. Uh, the buzzword is chat GPT these days, and how artificial intelligence is the future. It is. There is no doubt about it. But I don't know how it is possible that we can talk about multidisciplinarity, engaged scholarship, and all of the buzzwords that we use and miss the point that artificial intelligence is an instrument that we must learn, capitalize on, and yes, catch up and not be left behind. But it is an instrument. Thank you for the, yeah. the people who must uh, uh, shape the agenda yeah. are still people who are in the discourse that analyzes what our society wants, use the instrument in a manner that is befitting of all that does not discriminate others to move forward. Because time is not against me, and mm -hmm. I wanted actually to speak a little bit about what kind of an African range that we have that actually contributes to us being so um, in, in discordance. I am going to whisk through that and then uh, cite a few um, issues of conclusion. The African in this space, and, and as we seem to articulate it, is African as an indigenous person born in this or descendant in this particular continent. There's also an African that is born here but is a proud European diaspora. There is also an African that is born here 
and is loyal to Africa. Then there is an African that is self-identifying as an African, but they would rather be elsewhere, actually. And then there is an African that goes around claiming benefits of pan-Africanism as and when it suits them, or even pan-humanism for that matter. And there's a whole range of other definitions. But the point around this is that actually we are self-defeating by wanting to define or sometimes not even being aware of who these various versions of Africanness are loyal to. And so there are these people that we call markets, there are these people that we call partners, and then there are these people that we call researchers who have a propensity of making us data, who have a propensity of making us consumers of what is produced elsewhere. All of them in this milieu of Africanness as well. It is really confusing in terms of the agenda or even of being able to formulate an agenda. I just want to wrap quickly, Chair, without necessarily dwelling on some of these things, but I just want to say first that we are in some kind of hangover phase where we have a, a, a colonial ego that's lingering and we are not actually quite sure what it is doing. It's lingering amongst us as us. It's lingering amongst us as some partners. That we are in some kind of periphery status where we are forever asking for validation. And, and therefore, I want to persuade us in terms of a few things. The first one is, can we formulate an agenda? And that there is no shame in formulating an agenda. How we articulate it, it may not be at a forum like this on a, on a daily basis or in a seminar by seminar basis, but we need to formulate. It's not a shame to formulate an agenda that advances us in each and every partnership that we create. We don't want just to beg for money, rub shoulders, and it ends there. Secondly, we have to work on social cohesion. Because if we are conscious of who we are in relation to the agendas, the, the engagements that we do on a daily basis, then we will be able to stick with some kind of agenda that has some integrity. Now, I'm, I don't think that we are socially cohesive in terms of disciplines that can do multidisciplinarity. I don't think we are socially cohesive at all. You want me to stop, Chair? Oh, please go ahead. Okay. One minute. Okay. Um, I also wanted us to persuade us to use in the, the many avenues of the evolution of, of the discourse that can actually be helpful if we were not disturbed by the fact that we don't have an agenda. Engaged scholarship is underused, and yet it is the right way forward. It is underused because we focus on engagement sometimes, in which case we take our knowledge and go and civilize communities. It is underused because we focus on scholarship sometimes, in which case we, we formulate floating a, a, a scholarship in which everyone else is data. But we don't do engaged science that actually recognizes that it is from here and, and, and being rooted is not a problem, so that we can solve the problems by convergence of the multiple um, uh, disciplines in a way that creates newness, because challenges do create the uniqueness of solutions. We owe the continent this. Sure. We owe the continent the ability to maneuver in spite of the formats that actually streamline us. Because the problem of this particular sector, and that is why it is now behind the society, is that we are responding too much to formats. We want to look good to formats. This, see, it's not only an, a, a conceptual matter. 
it happens within our institutions that you end up finding that core business is supporting support. It's not support <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is supporting core business. We congregate in committees in order to, to help um, HR do things. We, we congregate in committees in order to ensure that uh, audits are happening or reviews are happening. But it's actually um, very rare that you get support saying, come here, we have been we're noticing that you need this, this, and that. Our formats are like this. How can we help you? In other words, I'm trying to say that in, a, in as much as it might sound conceptual, it has ways of translating itself into real, everyday, practical ways in which we stifle ourselves as this sector. One last point, Chair. It actually is spilling over in, so, towards society via institutions, because the institutions have the learned. When I say society, I'm talking about ordinary citizens. They are ahead of us. But public service is also streamlined into, into formats. Um, that must be convenient and must be validated as good by others. And so we feed back into society via institutions the rigidity of not moving forward because we are collapsing as a society because we, are, we have no discretion that should have come from our scholarliness and that should actually have devised new solutions for society. Let us expand the, the, the streak, the craving for being validated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Professor Stolle. That's that richness that whole idea of trying to engender the African idea of Africa and not an exotic one, I think the message is very clear. And thank you very much that we need to disrupt a lot of other things that seem to be orthodox and standard and try and center who we are. It's very much appreciated. Um, as um, your program director, I think I seem to have small privileges, you know. So one of these privileges is just to step aside the, the, the program and ask the, 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 the vice chancellor, the rector, to hand over gifts to our, to our visitors. And uh, these gifts are coming, one, from the, international, uh, uh, from the Office of International Affairs, headed by Dr. Cornelius Agmeyer, and from the Center for Gender and African Studies, headed by Dr. Stephanie Kehwood over there. Um, there are three heads here. One is for Sandu, the other one is for the wife, and the other one is for Professor Stephen Small from University of California, Berkeley. And the stick is for Sandu because he's growing old. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. Stephen, small. As you know, son. Okay, all right. Thank you. And I think this one is also for... From the international office. This is for the international no. office. So you're going to go with a handful of presents here. Thank you. Thank you Once very Once again, much. thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. I would like... I would like to offer you the latest version of the Deep book Decolonizing the Mind, which has a theoretical framework. And I... Thank you for the presence uh, on behalf of my wife, of Stephen Small. Thank you, uh, International Office Center of Gender and African Studies. I really appreciate it, and I hope we can continue this conversation on decolonizing the mind. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Certainly you. will. Thank you. <coughs> so, sorry for the ambush, uh, Vice Chancellor, but uh, it's one of those things. 
Um, uh, right now we are entering another phase for a very small artistic you know, expression so that before we go to the last round of our celebration. Africa belong. As the South, we believe that we should conquer Africa because, because of our rich mineral resources and our multiple ethnic groups. As the West, we believe we should conquer because our region is rich in resources and cultural diversity. And we are the home to the Nile River. <laughs> As the North, we believe Africa should be ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have created pharaohs and great pyramids and tombs. We could only build on our continent's riches and put Africa on top mm. of the world. They will help us in this situation. <laughs> great, great storyteller, please help us in this contest. To whom African diaspora belongs? To South? Yes. East? North? Of course. Oh, well. <coughs> Our mother of all mankind. We came here for answers, not riddles. <coughs> to, to whom does Africa belong? We shall find out for ourselves. <coughs> they know that I am not. It cannot be that we Together looking information, they search. Our journey took us to war stricken lands. They didn't give up. They continued to search, in searching and searching even more. What did they find? 
our journey in form of a past tragedy. Oh, the rich in form of him, they dig, dug, dug even more deeper, they exploited even more. Oh, shit, nothing in the south. Oh, riches. They continue looking information again and again and again. The scattering of our people. The riches on. They went through the mountains. Oh, those deep, deep valleys. They never came up. They even went into a flowing river. Even more to hot, hot desert. Poor riches, they remembered one thing. We remembered one thing. That Africa, South Africa is the mother of all mankind. When worship comes together toward building one unified Africa, one way we go back to our own roots, one way we continue to restore where diversity of knowledge, of being, is celebrated. If that is for all of us, our Kedula, mother of all mankind. What an important message that I wanted to connect with what Prof. Stolle shared with us here. There are lots of informalities that are there, and the most important question was, to whom does Africa belong? And I want to add, to whom does the earth belong? To whom does the earth belong? Cornelius, take us through the importance of knowledge at a global stage. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor, um, fellow panelists, 
colleagues, students, and in absentia, I want to particularly acknowledge Professor Vasu Reddy, our new Vice Chancellor, Research and Internationalization, who would have loved to be here. He had to travel, but asked me to specifically deliver on his behalf his message of support to our Africa Day celebration. I am going to engage with connecting African knowledge to the world. Epistemic diversity is a central tenet of internationalization and also of our university's Vision 130. It refers to the idea that there are many different ways of knowing and that no one way is superior to others. For knowledge generation, it is extremely beneficial to have the cross-fertilization between multiple knowledge paradigms. Strengthening epistemic diversity in Africa should maintain and enhance the value afforded to African knowledge globally. Sent, you mentioned on Tuesday that we should consider reconstructing disciplines by developing new concepts based on non-Western traditions. This is a powerful and impactful way to advance decolonization. My own view is that we should not discard the engagement with Western knowledge, but in it we should ensure that knowledge from Africa is afforded its rightful, equal position with all other knowledge. In Africa, we should consider reconstructing disciplines and processes in such a way that they are grounded in multiple knowledge paradigms and promote and put at a central place knowledge and ways of knowing and being from Africa. The challenge I want to engage with today is how to ensure that our work in internationalization, which connects us with different knowledge paradigms, can be structured to ensure that they promote knowledge in and from Africa. And as Vice Chancellor, you said last year, that it helps in putting African knowledge on the same pedestal as that what we call knowledge from the global north. In my contribution, I will explore how it is possible to strengthen the engagement between African and global knowledge and simultaneously ensure that African knowledge is afforded its rightful place. In the last years, significant progress has been made in terms of internationalizing higher education in South Africa and Africa. During the COVID periods, for example, here at the UFS, we continue to grow our African co-authored publications and managed to maintain those with other world regions at a stable level. We have strengthened other aspects of internationalization, embarked on the one hand on a curriculum internationalization project. We've also established a decolonization engagement group, and we have intensified our internationalization at home activities. Colleagues, we have moved far in rethinking internationalization. At the UFS, we have successfully refocused on growing our African collaborations whilst continuing to invest in our relationships with the rest of the world. However, a concern is that collaboration between Africa and the rest of the world continues to be influenced by coloniality. In other words, the challenge is that the system of power and the legacy of colonization continue to influence minds today and impact on the dynamics of knowledge exchange 
between Africa and other world regions. The colonial influence on African researchers, attitudes, and those of their counterparts outside the continent can be significant. Working at different South African higher education institutions, I have at times experienced that researchers or even academic leaders uncritically accept proposals made by colleagues from partner universities in the global north and at times do not formulate their own priorities. This brings about the risk of at times African collaborators being considered mere data collectors who are, instead of developing their own ideas, just assisting others in producing their knowledge. Other challenges for us include the politics of publishing pay gates, which hinder particularly at smaller African institutions access to research and knowledge. Besides, open access publishing can be prohibitively expensive. There I look really forward to Nambita's insights into how those challenges can be tackled and are practically tackled in our context. Thank you. You called us at the book launch to consider internationalizing decolonization. I fully agree that this is a major part of the task ahead. However, we also need to focus on rethinking internationalization itself. We need to ask the question whether the internationalization process itself should not also be decolonized. In other words, we should also consider how we can infuse multiple insights from multiple knowledge paradigms, methodologies, and approaches in the way in which we advance internationalization. Progress is already being made. Last year, a first proposal for a South African definition of internationalization was made. This conversation should be deepened. African philosophies for example, Ubuntu, Ubuntu should help us to develop, to develop our own context-specific understanding of internationalization. One important aspect of rethinking internationalization is that we should strive for fair and equal partnerships. I had the privilege to conduct research on this in my own PhD work. In partnerships, one should strive for substantive equality, which is very different from sameness. One can understand it as a contextual view of equality, which appreciates and promotes the diversity in partnerships. Equal partnerships I proposed should be rooted in values. And those should not be limited to our traditional canon of partnership values, but they should include Ubuntu. And I would actually go further. We should not only look at African philosophy as a foundation for internationalizing African higher education, but we should look what is it that we from Africa can share with the world. And I think Ubuntu is a concept from South Africa, from Africa as a whole, which we truly can share and from which the whole world can benefit. My proposition is, and I'm not going to go into depth here, that they should also be based on equally meaningful contributions by partners, that partners should be able to achieve their own priorities to the same extent, 
They should affirm diversity. They should affirm the equal worth of all those involved. There should be open and transparent communication. And last, it should also affirm the diversity of the partners themselves. Colleagues, students, guests, equal and fair partnerships will provide a fertile environment from the basis of which equal knowledge exchange can happen. They can serve as platforms to create and exchange knowledge. To promote knowledge from Africa, the African knowledge sector should formulate its own research and capacity development agenda based on its shared cultural and linguistic heritage, indigenous knowledge and historical experience. Besides, it is important for the continent to find the necessary resources to fund an equitable share of its collaborations. To be taken seriously as a partner in development and co research collaboration, African stakeholders should be aware of their capacity, the scientific achievements of the continent, its cultural heritage, and rich indigenous knowledge. Colleagues, Africa, in my view, can be proud of its scientific achievements, including the first heart transplant and developing philosophies such as Ubuntu. Another prerequisite for equal knowledge exchange between Africa and other world regions is strengthening intra-African knowledge exchange and development collaboration. We should, as I explained in a thought piece which is published on the Africa Month website, develop a common high African higher education space. Core features should include harmonization, intense intra-Africa academic and university collaboration, shared capacity development initiatives. Progress has been made, but in my view, we need to move faster towards this goal. An African higher education space would allow the continent to formulate its own research and education agenda based on its shared cultural, linguistic heritage and indigenous knowledge. By working together and leveraging research that integrates indigenous knowledge, African higher education stakeholders and universities could ensure that African knowledge claims its rightful space in the world. African intellectuals, in my view, are producing globally competitive knowledge which we should promote. <laughs> Colleagues, distinguished guests, I'm proposing that a self-assured Africa, conscious of the quality of its research and, and higher education institutions and the continent's heritage, could ensure that it is afforded the respect it deserves on the global stage. Working together and leveraging its research expertise, including research integrating indigenous knowledge, African higher education stakeholders and universities could ensure that African knowledge claims its rightful space worldwide. Meanful meanwhile, Individually, we should start with that what is in our sphere of influence. Universities, academics and researchers, in my view, should engage with the world with a sense of pride and leverage on the capacity, knowledge and insight from the continent. Thank you very much. message 
and uh, that we really need to connect Africa globally and also globally connect knowledges. In fact, there is the local in the global and the global in the local. So we can start talking about localization. Thank you for that message. And the idea that we need to decolonize internationalization and also internationalize decolonization. These are key messages. Very much appreciated. Nambita, tell us, why should we create publishing spaces in Africa, in higher education institutions in Africa? How do we go about doing this? Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Good afternoon, everyone. Allow me to use the greetings of my previous colleagues, not isolating anyone. Why not? That's my answer for you. Thank Why you. not? Because as Africans, we publish every day, but we are selling our publications to paywalls journals. Libraries are in forefront of innovative when it comes to scholarly communication, but the researchers, they don't see that work. However, we need to be globally exposure, to be globally exposed and have an impact. Because if we are not in globally exposure, we're not gonna be having an impact. By doing so, which means we have to have embrace open access that we always don't see it as a way of having things done. We have to do a diversifying of our research output because by doing that, we're going to close gaps. We're gonna have exposure. We're gonna have collaboration with other stakeholders abroad in Africa, because Africa shares a lot of resources. Then we also need to open our data so that it can continue to revive and produce things through our things. But you can't do that if we don't have infrastructure within our institution. The University of the Free State is the first institution to have their own journals that are hosted, but our academics, they don't see that. So if we don't support our infrastructures, we're not going to be publicly exposed because we prefer paywall journals that you collect the data from Africans but you sell your data to, to the Africans. In order for those Africans, they need to buy back through subscription channels to see what we have been produced. Why are we doing that to us, to our African? But at the end of the day, we are claiming that we are African. We are proud to say we are African. Why we are intimidating and sell our products abroad? University of the Free State have open access funding the library. Only if we support you, only if we you going to publish on open access journal. Because we believe that our research need to be publicly available without paying and without buying it back. Because if you publish in those paywall journals. Your people, remember, Africa is one of the countries that is poor when it comes to economy. So why are we suppressing our products that we are busy selling out and producing? And Africa is one of the countries that has got lots and lots of knowledge that they produce, but when it comes to that knowledge, our people, they are starving from getting that knowledge. We have a sunlit transformative agreements that also 
we are doing as a collaborative effort so that we can ease the pain of APCs from our researchers. But the researchers does not acknowledge that, that we have these transformative agreements that eliminates that. So I'm asking again, why not creating our spaces that we're going to own? Our own data, we collect it from our own people, but we keep it in closed doors. Why not open to them? So those infrastructures are everything because they need to be curated by our own people, but we turn a blind eye when it comes to that. In conclusion, open access publishing infrastructure and open access publishing funds improves accessibility, knowledge, democratization of global visibility, impact, research equity, and diversity, open data, and reproduction. Without those, I'm still asking you, Chair, why not having our own spaces that we're going to embrace? If we are still continues to sell our data that we collect from our poor people, we're still going to have this conversation in future. Why we are not embracing? Why can't we have our own infrastructure that supports our researchers? Because it's daunting to, to pay 43,000 of article processing while we can publish that information to open access journal so that your people can learn from what we have produced from them. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful message and thank you for challenging us to look inside because a story that starts in the wrong place will never arrive at the right conclusion. So we start, we need to start looking at ourselves, start the journey with ourselves, publishing with our own structures that are there. That is a very important message, very much appreciated. Allow me now to ask the rector and uh, vice chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor Francis uh, Peterson, to feed us on how the UFS is approaching this way or is putting strategies in place of promoting African produced knowledge and contribution to epistemology in terms of its diversity. Vice Rector and Vice Chancellor, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. <clears throat> So I had prepared a, a talk, but uh, sometimes the panelists throw something <laughs> on the table that, uh, um, that you have to adapt what you want to say to also just bring some other, some other perspectives. So I'm probably going to uh, uh, deviate from the script that I have to, to also respond to some of the, uh, 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 the statements that's been made. So uh, the focus of my talk, and I'm going to also try to make it a little bit shorter to, uh, to get you some of those minutes that uh, our first panelists uh, have, have, haven't given to you, yeah. but we will we'll try to balance it out. Thank you. So it, it is about promoting Africa uh, uh, um, produced knowledge, and, and I want to start off by saying that the university have launched the vision end of last year, Vision 130, and the vision is, um, is, is, is very much a vision that is outward focusing. Uh, it is tried to, to, to put uh, uh, our researchers, uh, our academics, but also our supporting staff uh, onto a global stage uh, and, and to tell the globe what we actually are doing at the University of the Free State. And we have heard uh, various speakers trying to indicate what we are doing, what we're collaborating, who we're collaborating with. And I can cite various programs at a, at a postgraduate level, various research projects that we are doing 
um, that, that, that we are doing actually, uh, not only within the University of the Free State, but also with, with scholars and knowledge producers on the continent, but on the global stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I'm not going to I'm not going to focus too much on that. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, um, our guest speaker of our guest uh, that is in fact hosted by the Center of Gender and African Studies, and we've got representation of the Gender of African Studies here in, in the whole is, is is one of those uh, uh, research groupings that's doing fundamental and and a, a lot of, of good work. But I want to come back to what I said earlier. Uh, now we 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 uh, we often have to frame what we're doing uh, uh, as a university uh, and as an organisation. What is the purpose of doing that? Um, and 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 I've been saying it uh, at various platforms in our university. Is that as university we should grapple with the question: if we're not doing it to better our society, then we should even question the existence of the university uh, as an institution. Um, if we go back to the producers of knowledge, then uh, universities are producing most of the knowledge that we have uh, um, in the world today. And it's important, then, therefore, to say and to ask the universities, how do you actually frame that? Uh, um, in terms of the value of the knowledge that we are producing. I'm not even uh, talking about the different knowledge systems mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the discussion has been around that. So for me, I often go back to let's, uh, and that's my frame, and in fact it's also embedded in Vision 130, which is our new vision, uh, and, and our strategy is linked to it. It's within the sustainable development goals that we embed uh, 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 our purpose. And there's 17 of those, but, but I, I want to, to probably cite probably three or four. Uh, the ones that's closest to me, it is about the whole issue of quality education, and, 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 and specifically on the African continent, that uh, is the, the continent with the largest group of, of youth, and they're gonna be our next, our future generation. That is going, that's gonna inform this discussion that we just have today. Uh, um, it is also about gender uh, uh, equality. Uh, it, 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 it is about poverty and inequality. And I want to, 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 to extract the inequality component out, out of that. And then there's, a, there's, there's probably the, the, the largest one for me, it is about uh, uh, your know, sustainable development goal number 17, which talk about partnerships. Mm. Um, but if you draw th right through it, the whole issue of equity and equality, then it is about fairness. Uh, uh, um, but I want to, uh, I'm not talking like a philosopher, uh, 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 <laughs> but I want to pull it, pull it further down and to say it is about a value-based a value system. Uh, uh, um, that we should embed, and 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 it was important. It's important for me that in our conversation about knowledge systems and about different knowledges, uh, um, that we pull it back to why it's important to value the different knowledge system, because it's the same argument that we would have that you can't have all of these, say, SDGs being delivered on if you don't have the different disciplines working together to be able to deliver that. Because otherwise you would never be able to solve it. And if we have the same reali realization that for these purpose-driven sustainable development goals, it's not only one particular knowledge or an approach to knowledge that is gonna resolve and gonna give us solutions to that. It is about all the knowledge systems mm -hmm. that has to come together to be able to give us the delivery of your sustainable development goals, to make a better world, a safer world, a fairer world, to build equality 
in the world. And therefore, if that is for us an understanding, then we will have to challenge and understand how fairness and equity plays out in policy, as you have indicated, play out in funding instruments. How do you, mm. how do you put funding instruments together? Play out in partnerships. Mm. And, 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 and for me, it, 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 it is about what I would call the co-creation of, of these, of, 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 of conceptual solutions that is based on equity in the knowledge and the knowledge system that have to come to the table to deliver on it. And, 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 I, and I want to use the word co-creation in a way to also link up to my learned colleague on my right. Uh, um, when we talk about academics and support, I think our, for our approach is not perfected as yet, but our approach is that between academics and support staff, there should be a co-creation. Uh, um, and it's not, this is what the academic needs and the support go and try to figure, figure it out. It is about co-creating that together. Mm. And if we have that sort of approach uh, um, in the way in which we deal with, I actually don't want to use the word, but global north and global south mm. type of knowledge systems, uh, um, then I do believe that we would make inroads in terms of the equity and the value that knowledge systems bring to the table to resolve the challenges that humanity is sitting with at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and where would one start? I do agree, uh, agenda setting is very important. And I often say in a South African context that we've got various system bilaterals between Canada and South Africa, between UK and South Africa, between the European Union and South Africa. Why don't we set our agenda within that as a sector, but also as a continent, so that this could strengthen the purpose of why we're doing it in the first mm -hmm. place. And I would say, Pick those universities, those countries that are on the same page of this understanding. They're not all on the same page, and we know. But pick those, because I think if we start to work with that, then we will set examples and we'll gain momentum. And, 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 and I want to, want to finish off um, in the debate yesterday, there were two vice chancellors from universities in the UK, two, I would probably say in the top 10 universities in the UK. And they, they said that they actually want to move away from just, you know, the ranking systems and the fact mm -hmm. that you got superior knowledge and the fact that you got superior institutions, because if you're number one, you still have to work hard because it drives a competitive mm. approach in the system. I want to be the best. Uh, um, and if you're the best, you, you still continue to do the best because the other number two, three, four is coming for you to, 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 to get that, 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 that number one spot. So what, this, uh, what she was arguing, uh, this particular vice chancellor, is that is tiring. It's starting to be competitive in that perspective. But, it's, but secondly, it moves away from the natural uh, firmness of what it is to be human. And to is to be human is actually to collaborate. Mm -hmm. It's actually to work together. And why? Because we want to resolve the issues that the world need to resolve. And without Africa, Without India, without other Latin America, we're not going to be able to resolve that. So for me, the message that I want to, uh, want to leave here is, yes, we need to ensure that knowledge from Africa, 
find its rightful place. Mm -hmm. I think the world is right for that. Mm -hmm. What the world is not ready for is how. Uh, and uh, you talk about uh, um, open access. There's about seven, ten countries in Africa that is supporting open access. But I question the government's support behind it. Governments say that we are supporting open access, mm -hmm. but what does it mean? What does it mean for open access infrastructure on the mm -hmm. continent? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that's the things that we need to be focusing on. Uh, um, and I do think that there is more support out there in the global world that we give credit for. But I agree with, again, with Professor Satoli. Uh, um, we mustn't apologize for being on that, at that table. I think they want us at that table, and we need to get our agenda in order, drive it, and take those, at least, that are ready to work with us to show that this can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reta, for that wonderful message in terms of the way forward and how we should try and work together globally and connect. And this whole idea of ecologies of knowledge, it is not just about critique, as we see in many theories, it is about doing the work. So we should move away from just critiquing, even if it is Western knowledge, but let us see how we can do the work on the ground. Thank you for the beautiful message. Very much appreciated. Uh, I would love to say that uh, to those of you who have been noting down questions, comments, burning issues, uh, that uh, segment is no longer there. Deposit your questions with the international office, you know, then they will be responded to for, from each of these speakers if you had any burning question. We are trying to manage time now. So that section, I'm sorry to say, it's crept out. We really have to manage time as it is. So we, if you allow me a minute before I hand over to the person who should really thank us here for this work, is to simply say, I think the message that I got from all the presentations is for us to work very hard to grow the African idea of Africa, because that's talking about knowledge from and in Africa. So we must try and promote that. So we start with our journey. The idea is to start the story with ourselves. We start from here to there, and not there to here. And that is what Nguki Wationgo tells us is global lectics. Start from what you know. Start with your local river. Know your local rivers, valleys, mountains, etc. by name before you know that Vancouver is the largest city in British Columbia. So I think this is the message I get. I want to hand over to, to Rubimbo to give us a piece in terms of photo of things. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, firstly, I just want to thank all the speakers. Um, they had a lot to obviously say and a lot of information that I think is very impactful um, to the people that are, that are in this room. But the first thing that I really want to say is that, or to let the people in this room know, is that you are who we've been waiting for. Majority of Africa, of Africa or the population of Africa constitutes of the youth, which is the people that are in this room. So in this dialogue, we've been having conversations as to how do we nationalize or how do we decolonize the mind in such a way that we allow indigenous knowledge systems to take precedent, and not in a way that we get rid of the Western education, but in a way that we can empower indigenous knowledge systems. And that starts with the people that are within this space or within this room. There were things that are obviously noted down from the speakers that have posed certain questions that I think as the people in this room, we need to also take from, all right? So I'm just gonna 
pose these um, very important questions that I believe would start up the dialogue or start up the actions of how do we ensure that our spaces are inclusive, our spaces are representation of who we are as Africans, right? So the question that I want to pose is how then or however, right, how do we as people share the knowledge with the rest of the world when we have integrated and almost blended in so well with the Western education systems in such a way that does not take away from the current educational system, but adds to our indigenous systems. So this is the homework that we have as Africans, as the youth that are the future of Africa. So it start, the work is starting from us. So how do we ensure that within the spaces that we are influencing, the spaces that we have close relations with, that is within your family, when you travel to different areas, how do we ensure that we are promoting the very concept of indigenous knowledge systems? Do we take our knowledges, do we take our heritage with us when we travel? Or do we leave it behind because it's been made to seem as if it is not enough, it's inadequate in the Western education system. So when we travel and we go to the United States, do we take our African ethnicity with us or do we leave it behind? So in order for us to try and ensure that the spaces that we're residing in are inclusive and they appreciate the indigenous knowledges that we possess or that we have, we as the youth have to start capitalizing on those indigenous knowledge systems. How do we, from a very diverse background, diverse backgrounds that we come from, especially being in the University of the Free State that is diverse, that has an international space, how do we ensure that we are promoting indigenous knowledge system? Professor Peterson spoke about the Vision 130 and how it is something that has built within the sustainable goals that are pre-existing, right? That is very powerful. That means that if we can infiltrate the system of the institution of the university, then we are able to somewhat reach the sustainable goals that we, we as Africans or as a nation are trying to aim to try and reach, right? Another thing that I want to take note of is that we need to decolonize the mind. Unfortunately, this is something, a concept that I think we cannot run away from. When I speak about decolonizing the mind, I'm not talking about particularly in terms of colonialism, but I'm talking about decolonizing the mind in terms of how do we view indigenous knowledge systems in comparison to Western knowledge systems. Do we see them in the same hierarchy or do we see them as less than? Do we see indigenous systems as less than? Because if we have that mentality, we are unable to actually create and formulate transformation that is needed or that will give us as Africans the ability to compete or to be competing uh, members of the international um, stage. And that is something that we are trying to obviously advocate for, right? Um, so within that, I just want to say a few more um, words, um, is that the value of the land is determined by its people, um, its culture, the people in terms of culture, sustainability, knowledge, and most importantly, Ubuntu. So if, as Africans, we are unable to practice the biggest value that I think we all resonate with, and I say this as the SRC International, I say it in the sense that as SRC International, I'm not only representative of the international students, but a representation of everyone that is in this room. So when you talk about the concept of Ubuntu, it's something that resonates with Africa at large. Are we able then to ensure that we within our cultures are sustaining that. Are we sustaining the concept of Ubuntu to such a degree that it is impactful and it reaches many people? Ubuntu is, because, is the concept that I am because you are. Um, we also had, I think, um, No Bata Nabita, forgive me for mispronunciation. Um, she spoke about how we are selling our knowledges and then as Africans we're buying it back. And then that, that ties in with the concept of Ubuntu. Are we as Africans treating each other the way that we're supposed to be treated? Because if that's the concept that we're running with, then there's a big room, a big gap that we as the youth can take space in because we're believing and we're living in the concept of Ubuntu. Um, with that having been said, I just want to thank the speakers. I think 
you really gave us something to think about. I may not have given the fair, fair representation of every single person that's in this room, but I do want to say thank you so much for sitting in this room because it's, it's through these dialogues, these um, engaging dialogues with academia, with people that have knowledge that we're able to form and get something out of it. We are planting seeds of change. So I don't want people in this room to believe that this was just a dialogue. I think that we should be inspired and start changing the spaces that we are in so that we can be the change that we want to see. Change begins from us, and not from just having dialogues, but from actively doing something, because we want to see Africa being great. We want to be comp fair competitors on that global market and that international stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rubimbo, for giving us that uh, important uh, summary of the discussion and for winding it. I would now like to ask Becky or anyone from the international office to, to close. It's not my prerogative, I'm too small to do that. Becky, will you do the honors? You were the one who led the compilation of this book. Whilst you walk here, just to say, Vice-Chancellor, all that what we expressed in dialogues, which we facilitated last year, we have put it together in a little publication so that we can be inspired by it in years to come, and we will surely undertake the same this year so that we can have a continuing conversation. But over to you, Becky to just introduce and hand over to our panelists and say where to find it for everyone else. Okay, no problem. Sorry, um, I had to quickly run out. Sanju, your shuttle is outside. So that's why I was outside to just make sure he doesn't miss his flight. <laughs> so I thank you so much for coming. Um, can we give Sanju a round of applause? Um, I'll just be quick. Um, so we decided to, to create um, a reporting booklet on all diversity activities that, we, uh, that are taking place on campus, or that rather we have been um, um, involved in and doing. So we do hope to continue, as Dr. Cornelius did say, we do hope to continue to actually improve the style how we are doing it and document and publish what we are doing as an institution. I think it's very much important where students are involved, we do showcase that and appreciate what the institution is doing itself. So the documenting and having this on, on a more formal basis being published assists us in, taking, uh, in bringing forth all the cultural diversities that are happening within our institution and also in the world for, longer lasting, for a longer lasting effect. So I think uh, just to keep it short, I'll, ca I'll cap it there and to share my gratitude for all of you coming and my appreciation. And thank you so much for the panel and till next time. Thank you. The booklet is on the website. And I think you'll find it through the international offices website, so. Can we, yeah, we are still audible. <laughs>